I'm going to talk through something I've been thinking about for a while. Uh, it involves free will, free speech, and our metaphorical conception of causation. Uh, if that sounds like a lot, it is. Um, first off, I feel like I say this all the time, but it's a very simple idea. Like evolution is a very simple idea, but when you try to apply it to the world, it immediately gets so complicated, it's hard to think about. And I feel like uh, cognitive linguistics is the same way, where the very simple idea is that our concepts, our abstractions, our ideas come from the fact that we are bodies moving around in space. And we take the facts that we get hot and cold, we can move around, we see in front of us, we fall down, we get up, we can grasp things with our hands. Um, things can go over our heads, things can be underneath us, we can fall into water and get wet. All of these experiences we use to think abstractly about our world, about our emotional experience, about our identity, and about ideas, right? You can grasp ideas, just like you can grasp a ball. Um, your body can get hot, you can get hot in terms of desire. Um, there's like an endless amount of these. But, uh, so that's the basic idea. One of the ways that I think it's interesting to try to um, apply all of this, or one of the ways that it gets very complicated is to start thinking about, you know, how language emerged, which, you know, you can imagine it was in groups that are gaining a greater ability to communicate through hand gestures and other signals where, uh, some kind of rudimentary language gives them not only the ability, ability to organize and communicate, but at some point also gives them the ability to talk about causation, why things happen, and then to uh, deal with how you blame people or how you blame individuals for actions. Blame, I think, is actually a fairly large part of why language exists. Um, to talk about causation, you are almost inherently talking about blame. Who is responsible? So uh, if you take out who is responsible from most of our conversations, it's very hard to talk about many things. I mean, just to take, for example, this COVID situation, which, you're, which we are in currently, how much of the conversation is just about trying to ascertain blame. You know, China's to blame for this, Trump's to blame for this, the, the individual Congress people are to blame for this, uh, the American public is to blame for this, uh, the CIA is to, like, every conversation that I see is trying to create some kind of causal network in which they then identify the agent that they think is most to blame for all of the downstream effects that come from that person. Um, and so here's how we metaphorically conceive of the idea. And I guess this, <laughs> I should have started out talking about what the actual point of this is. So we talk about free will and free speech. And I think, Inserting that word free is a mistake in both of those because it immediately begs the question, free from what? Um, so when we are metaphorically speaking causally about the world and trying to ascertain blame, this is the basic system in which that happens. We think of ourselves as individuals, and we have 
Uh, we can stand up and we can have strong spines. And we can resist the causal forces that are swirling around us, right? So social forces, social pressure. I mean, just the idea of social pressure is like something is pushing on you, right? Uh, all these different pressures that we have, political pressures, uh, relationship pressures, all these pressures from outside of you are pushing on you. And depending on how strong you are, you can resist the pressures. Uh, so it's almost like walking down a path and having this a strong wind just blowing against you, right? And if you're weak, you will just blow wherever the wind wants you to go. And But if you build up enough strength and you're strong, you can resist it and you can maybe just stay in one spot or possibly slightly move against it. Um, and we use all sorts of forces, not just pushing like applied force in physics or wind, but we think of this in terms of water, uh, we think of this in terms of electricity and magnetism and all the physical forces that exist that we can experience with our body. Um, so that's, I think it's important to identify how most, and I guess I'm going to, this isn't all people use this compounded metaphor, but a lot of people do. And I think it's important to recognize uh, how people talk about this just in everyday life, not, not how philosophers talk about it, um, but just how, how our basic conceptions of this particular situation have emerged out of human, the problems of human cooperation versus individuality. Um, so there's nothing free about will in that conception. The way we talk about will is not as if it's free. Free will, and I'd be interested to know what the history of taking the idea of will and then just tacking on that word free actually is. But again, I think in this debate, I think it's important to understand that people talk about will as the ability to resist forces and not necessarily this total freedom to make all of these choices that are unburdened uh, by the forces around you. I don't, I don't know anyone that actually speaks, metaphorically speaks about will in that way. Um, and so I think it would do the argument over free will a lot of good to focus on how people understand it. Because the problem that comes in this debate is that when people assert uh, there is no free will, right? And what it creates this uh, paradox, because like I believe that language has largely evolved to understand causation and blame. And so when we assert an idea within that system that nobody's to blame, it does this strange thing where you really can't talk about it anymore in, in particular ways. Or, or as the person is making a, an argument in which there is no free will, they're just constantly con metaphorically contradicting themselves as they're speaking. Uh, because you just can't escape this context uh, of, of language um, that I think is has been designed to negotiate these very problems. <clears throat> okay. And then you have debates about free speech. And I, I think this is pretty much the same issue. I'm actually... I always tend to be on the side of free speech. It's very hard for me to uh, think of a situation in which I would be against it. But I also do, I think that the word free there is causing 
unnecessary problems in terms of communication. Because what typically happens in these kind of debates is somebody asserts free, the idea of free speech and then the person's response, which is a legitimate response, which is free from what? Like legally free, but you're not free from the consequences of the social context in which you're in. So when people get mad at you, when people ban you or shun you or uh, call you horrible on the internet, you're not free from that reaction. You're, you're just legally free from not being incarcerated. Right, and that's a, that's a legitimate point. You're not free, it's, it's, the same, uh, it's the same idea. You, our speech is intimately bound up in all of the people around us, in the social context in which we sit. And in no way are you ever free from any of those things. Um, and I, I don't know, I honestly don't know what it would do to this conversation of just talking about it, just talking about speech. You know, it's like, instead of, does this person is it, has this person's free speech been infringed upon? Um, does it change the debate to say, does this per, has this person's speech been infringed upon? Because I, I think, um, in my mind, it does make a difference. Uh, and I think there's a decent amount of metaphorical research that shows that when you prime somebody with a particular I'd metaphor, such, in, you know, this free is ultimately a metaphor concept in this conception, you know, because it primes you to think about things that are unbound, you know, that this is a, a concept that is unbound from all of these other things. Uh, and I think that's, that's a mistake. It's a, it's not how people talk about it. I think it's how a very select few philosophers speak about it. Uh, and that we shouldn't bend to kind of folk theories of how people conceive of reality through metaphor, because obviously, you know, uh, science and philosophy can sometimes come up with better explanations and more precise uh, explanations for what's going on. I, I think a classic example would be that because of the invention of the steam engine and Freud's ideas about, you know, sexual energy and pressure, there's this folk theory about, uh, you know, that if we don't have sex, that there's this pressure and energy that builds up inside of us. And it causes us to do all of these crazy things. And, and we just need to release that pressure in order to uh, calm everything back down. So like, if you have a friend who is single, you know, commonly, not commonly, but you know, every once in a while I hear someone say something like, oh, well, they just need to get laid, you know, because they're, uh, that's going to release this internal pressure that's building up inside of them uh, and cause them to act normal again. And this is kind of a silly thing. Uh, it's a silly idea. It, it doesn't really work that way. Um, having sex typically leads to wanting to have more sex. It doesn't, it doesn't just instantly relieve the pressure of ever uh, wanting to have sex again. Now, now of course, there, there's partial truths to all of these things. The reason these metaphors exist is that there is this linkage, this, uh, this association between these two domains that people have linked. And so some of those associations are deep and compounded and complex. And some of those associations are fairly surface and inconsequential. You know, like we talk about the foot of the mountain, but we don't extrapolate that metaphor to talk about the mountain as a body in any other way. Uh, I saw this debate on 
Twitter about what you call the ends of a loaf of bread. And some people said heels and some people said butts. Uh, again, we, we aren't extrapolating on the bread as a body and all the different types of body parts of bread. Except these are, these are all fairly shallow associations that uh, may just be amusing to come up with and think about. And that's the only reason they exist. Um, and, and they don't really have much effect on anything at all. Uh, but the reason I think it's important to focus on language in certain problems, especially in problems of philosophy, is that you are essentially, uh, you're dealing almost entirely with words and how people construct kind of this ling metaphorical linguistic reality derived from their experience and the associations they make. And I think it's worthwhile um, taking into account those folk theories that people have. While they're not entirely true, there is this partial truth um, that can, that's, I think is important to include in the debate. So that's, that's all I got. I'm gonna go work in my garden now. <laughs>